Hello everyone, happy evening. Uh, this is Jude Deva from Pushpalata Vidya Mandir on Pushpalata Learner Live channel. Once again, we are back on Pushpalata Learner Live. I welcome everyone on behalf of Pushpalata Schools. Eat well, sleep well, and do more exercises and stay healthy. And don't miss to watch our Pushpalata Learner Live channel. We are gaining more and more information as well as knowledge from various experts from various fields. This is not an end, it is the beginning. As we all know, students are the backbone of our society. We learn and upgrade ourselves day by day, thinking about our future. So what are we going to learn and gain today? Let us wait and watch. Many of us know about space and we have learned more about it in school. But how many of us know about space economy, space law, and the future of space resource utilization, debris, and space habitats? How many of you know about it? So yes, we have here with us our guest speaker, Ms. Deepika J. Kodi, Advanced LLM in Air and Space Law, Leiden University, on the topic, Our Future in Space. Ms. Deepika J. Kodi is a Commercial Contracts Officer at an aerospace and defense company in Netherlands. She holds an Advanced LLM in Air and Space Law from the Leiden University, and LLM is International Law and Indian Constitutional Law from the Madras University, a Diploma in IP Laws and a BABL Horns from the TNDAL, Tamil Nadu Dr. Ambedkar La University in Chennai, India, and attended the International Space University Space Studies Program in 2018. She is the co-founder of CHEER, a human rights-based NGO in Chennai, India, and practiced law at the Madras High Court prior to moving to the Netherlands. She recently co-authored a book on innovation and intellectual property strategy. So now let me hand over the session to Ms. Deepika Jaikudi. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Good evening. Yeah, good evening, ma'am. Hope you are fine. All is good. Hope everyone watching yeah. at home is also doing well, all safe and healthy. Yeah, yeah. And we are happy to have you here on our Pushpalata Learned Live channel, ma'am. And thank you for accepting our invitation on behalf of Pushpalata Schools. Thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing uh, great questions and then also your feedback on the uh, session. Sure, sure. And uh, students and viewers are waiting for your words, ma'am. You can take over the session now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Is my uh, screen visible already? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Fantastic. Yeah. So once again, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Um, I want you to take a few seconds to imagine something. When I say the word space, what is the first thing that pops in your mind? Just think about it. Hold that picture in your head. At the end of the session today, I want you to um, leave the session knowing a bit more about the picture that you have in your mind or a bit of things that you don't already know. So when you say the word space, it means different things to different people. For some, it's social and cultural. So it's all about the stories that you've heard. Uh, it's about movies that you may have seen. And uh, it's something that brings us together just as a sense of curiosity. When you look up at the sky and you think about oh, what's what's going on out there. Um, for some others, um, it's scientific. There's a lot to be learned um, uh, from space. And for some people, it's also commercial. There's a lot of business uh, that goes on. Uh, you probably don't look at the sky and think, hey, there's a business out there that's dealing with this. Um, and then for some others, it's very political. And no matter what our relationship to space is, our future is definitely tied to what goes on in space. So today, uh, in this session, I would like you to, um, to learn about a few things. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions that you have. At the uh, end of the session, uh, at the end of the session, and before we go into uh, the details, I'd like you to also know a bit about myself. Um, I have a small connection to a lot of people that 
uh, are watching this program right now. I studied in over 10 schools. Um, and one of the schools that I uh, studied in uh, is in Tirnalveli. It's one of my favorite districts. And anytime somebody asks me um, what my favorite place in the world is, uh, in the top three, I would always say Tirnalveli as a district. Um, and many of you uh, who learn um, uh, Tamil, uh, you would have heard about uh, the different uh, Tinais, um, Kurunji, Marudam, uh, Palai, Mullai, and so on. And for me, Tirnalveli represents that one district that has all of this together. So it's, it holds a very special place in my heart. Um, I currently live in the Netherlands uh, for work. Um, but I was uh, born and brought up uh, in India, of course. I moved here to uh, study and, and then I continued uh, working here. I still have very close connections uh, uh, to my uh, friends uh, back home, but also because of work. So uh, I'm part of a human rights based uh, NGO that's uh, in Chennai. We uh, work with um, uh, transgender people and uh, for supporting rural children uh, learn in an uh, environment that is outside of school, so more on activity-based learning and so on. And me as a person, I love uh, learning. So you see that I have a lot of interests. Some of the interests, I've held on to them uh, and, uh, uh, and I've uh, shaped my work and career around it. And then there are a few other things uh, that keep me going uh, when I'm tired of work or uh, things uh, or other things. Um, when I was in school, there were a lot of things that I wanted to do. Some of the uh, few things that I was really interested in was uh, art and design. Um, and I think before I choose to uh, uh, do something with my uh, career, I thought, OK, maybe I should also uh, try my luck uh, trying to direct movies. That was that was really uh, what I wanted to do. Um, but there was also something else uh, that I thought, OK, nobody in my family has done it. I don't know anybody uh, who I can look up to and say, OK, this is somebody that I want to be. So then I decided to do law. Uh, this was quite uh, early on. So I decided already in um, in 10th tenth, uh, in tenth standard that I would uh, study law. So I, I chose a track that I thought might be a lot more uh, useful for it. Um, and just because I made that decision that early on, it doesn't mean uh, everything was uh, smooth. So if I have to look back um, uh, at my academic path, uh, or my career path, there were a lot of uh, uncertainties. There were there were always questions on, okay, will I be good at uh, what I'm uh, trying to pick? Will I uh, understand what is going on if nobody else in my family has uh, uh, studied these subjects? Um, will I be able to uh, succeed as, as, a, as a woman and a first generation lawyer? Uh, and of course, there are a lot of uh, failures as well. Um, uh, there are things that, that just don't happen. And uh, one of the key lessons for me was uh, no matter what, you have to hold on to that hope. Uh, and if there's something that you really like, that you really want to do, you will find a way to uh, continue along that path no matter what challenges you face. So having said that, uh, let's uh, go uh, into the subject. Um, for a lot of people, space law seems like it's uh, something very new. It's it's very recent, um, but that's that's not true. So even before we started sending uh, satellites and, and rockets into space, um, there were people who were writing about uh, what our behavior should be like if we ever have interactions with space. So it doesn't matter if we are putting things in space or, or there were even people who were writing about what you should do if you meet uh, aliens. Um, so this is, this is quite um, uh, old. And what is uh, fascinating about this subject is that unlike other fields of law, there's a lot of potential uh, here. There are a lot of avenues that you can choose even within space law that you can specialize in. And there's a lot of interaction with uh, different kinds of people that you will meet. I'll tell you more about it later on. So it's it's quite a special uh, uh, field in my in my opinion. The role of law in in general is to make sure that our 
the activities that we do are conducted in an appropriate manner that they are uh, done for the right purposes, that they bring in the right benefits and outcomes and so on. And space law naturally follows uh, the same approach. Um, you must have all uh, read or at least heard about uh, World War II already. Even before this time, countries like Germany, USSR and um, uh, uh, US were involved in developing space technologies. But right after the war, um, there was a bigger boost to it. So there was a Cold War, there was this race to see who will be the first uh, country that gets to space. And you all know how uh, Russia won that race. Um, they launched the Sputnik uh, satellite. So while this constant Cold War was going on between, between uh, USA and then USSR, um, the international community was also hoping that we don't repeat the same mistakes that happened or that led to the war. So they said, OK, at least space should be a place where things are conducted peacefully, that there are uh, no conflicts uh, that are transferred from Earth to space. So then they uh, then they created a, a committee that was uh, going to look into uh, how we should use space for peaceful purposes. And India was one of the founding uh, countries that was that was in this uh, committee. And then they developed different kinds of laws. So space law is not it's not just one thing uh, that pops up. Uh, it works in different levels. So you have several international uh, principles, documents that contain principles on uh, how we should uh, behave in space. Uh, some of these principles have been codified uh, or they have been made formal into what you would call international treaties. So these are at international level. We will look at one uh, international treaty later on. So you have different laws in the, uh, in the international level. And at the national level, the countries can adopt what sort of specific rules they want to include in addition to what is already there under international laws. Um, so India for now is working on uh, a specific uh, uh, space law for itself because we are trying to, we have a lot more uh, companies and organizations that are interested in doing many amazing things in space. We thought, okay, now is the time to, to make sure we know exactly what we can do and what we can't do. So, uh, so you should know that India is working on it. And then you have something called soft law. Soft law is, um, these are like guidelines. So um, in general, if you think about law, law is something that is, um, that is binding. So which means if you don't follow the law, there are some consequences for it. Um, a soft law is not like that. Soft law is voluntary, um, but it is also very important because even when, um, when a treaty like law or a national law doesn't exist, organizations can come together, countries can come together and say that, okay, we see a problem here and we think if we follow these steps, we can solve it. So even without the law, they think, okay, this is good behavior. So let's go ahead with that. So if you think about space law, you need to think about everything that comes together, the things at the international level, things at national level and the soft law, which is operating on both sides. So if you have to leave today with one thing that you will learn, um, uh, you, can, you can say, I've learned something about uh, the Outer Space Treaty. This is the uh, most important uh, law uh, under international space law. So 110 countries, are they have signed uh, uh, this treaty and, and they've adopted it, which means they have to follow uh, uh, this treaty. And what this treaty does is that it lays down certain principles. It says, again, in very simple terms, what we can do and what we can't do in space. And it applies to countries. And like I said before, uh, the countries then take the responsibility to, uh, uh, to make their own laws for, for its people. But even if they don't make the laws, if a country has signed this treaty, it means that that country is responsible for whatever the people of their country do. Okay. So what does this law say? The Outer Space Treaty, so it has very simple rules. It, it says 
space needs to be used for peaceful purposes only. There must be international cooperation and space can be explored and used by all. So it doesn't matter how big or small your country is. It doesn't matter how rich or poor the country is. It is free for anybody. And then there are some very strict don'ts. So they say you should not uh, appropriate space. So what does that mean? So nobody can say I own the moon. So when uh, the American astronauts, when they planted the flag on the US moon, it doesn't mean that they own the moon. So it's a mark to say that they were first, but they can never own the moon. Um, the second thing is that you should never use nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction in space, because then that goes against the principle that uh, space is uh, something that can be used and explored by all. And then there are uh, rules on how uh, uh, we should regulate these activities. So like I said, the countries are responsible for the activities of their citizens or organizations that, that come that work within their countries. And they, the countries then exercise control over these people. So countries can give licenses. They can say, oh, well, no, we don't think uh, this is safe. So you can't do it and so on. And the whole of um, uh, space law, it works around the uh, premise that there must be international cooperation. Uh, we must show uh, reciprocity. Um, so if one of, uh, let's say India has a, a space station uh, somewhere uh, on the moon, um, it can say, okay, if the US grants access to their station, they can also come and look at our station. So you can exchange scientific data and so on. So it, it works around this premises. There's a lot of cooperation that is built around it. Now, so if you have all these space laws, what are they trying to uh, regulate? Now, remember that picture that you had in your mind. Uh, try to match up with the things that I will put forward to you now and see how much you already knew. Uh, I'm curious also to hear how much you, uh, you didn't know. Um, a lot of people think, okay, why should we, uh, why should we invest in space? Uh, why is this so important? And if you think about it, space is something that we use every day in our uh, lives without even realizing that we, uh, that we do it. Unfortunately, the significance and the benefits of space are not communicated as effectively as they should. Um, and space is very vital for our future. And now you may think, okay, uh, you are overselling this. So from right from the cell phone that you use to how ATMs are operated, to how we understand our body and health, um, whether it's for monitoring um, uh, how we, uh, yeah, weather or how we use uh, our soil, uh, is there deforestation that is happening? Um, how do we manage disasters? Can we give humanitarian assistance somewhere? All of this revolves around activities that we do in space. Um, so you can, so a lot of, uh, there are a few countries that even call uh, satellites and things in space critical national infrastructure. So if you want electricity, if you want water, you, you don't think about how, how easily it comes to you. Tap the water or the switch pota light either. It's it's very simple. The same way there are things that we don't see that are enabled specifically by space. So we'll see more about it here on. Very often uh, you get asked the question when there are so many people suffering on earth, why should we spend uh, money on putting satellites? Why should we go study a planet? Uh, why should we do this? Why should we do that? Um, we will talk about numbers here. So the first number that you see, it's a very large amount. I cannot even think immediately how many zeros there are to uh, 271 billion US dollars. So this represents 74% of the space budget of the world. And this is mostly, uh, uh, this is this is just the revenues in uh, 2019. And then there's another 26%, uh, which we call public spending. So that's the money that the government, uh, the different governments of the world 
spend uh, on space technology, on, on different uh, missions and things like that. Um, and the biggest spenders are US, China, Russia, uh, Japan, uh, France, Italy, and India comes within the last, uh, let's say, the, the bottom rung of the top 10 countries. Um, and India's spending is only 2% of the global spending. So if you think about the full picture, it's not much, but we are still doing a lot. Um, this year, the government allocated 13,479 crores. You might think, yo, you blow Panama. But if you break it down, you must know that your parents are paying taxes, right? So for every taxpayer um, or every person uh, that is there in India, it only amounts to 130 rupees per person per year. So some of you may spend the 130 rupees just, I don't know, buying a game or uh, uh, buying uh, uh, burgers and, and coffees and things outside. So for 130 rupees per person per year, there is a lot that we gain out of it. Now, space helps uh, to improve uh, science. There's a lot that we learn from uh, different things by looking at different planets, by looking at uh, uh, different, uh, let's say, stars and how galaxies function. We are not only understanding where we come from, but we are also understanding what is happening in, uh, uh, let's say, in the planet that we live in and how it will uh, evolve. So if there are things that we need to protect ourselves, we learn from these missions. Just to give you an example, um, uh, some of you must have learned about the uh, ozone layer depletion. So how did we find out about this issue? There was a mission to Venus where uh, the first uh, signs of, of a, let's say, an ozone depletion um, uh, were detected. And they said, okay, this is also happening uh, uh, in Earth. So what is the effect? And that is how we found out that our ozone layer is depleting. So you might think some, some mission is irrelevant for you, but then it helps in our daily life. Um, so it helps uh, science. It helps to, uh, let's say, for different governments, different organizations. It helps in cost savings. Um, those are things that are not entirely visible, but it helps that. Um, it helps uh, build a lot of innovation that can be used not just in space, but also in our daily lives in different ways. So if you look at uh, water filters that we know, if you look at, um, let's say, uh, the camera on your uh, phone, um, if you think about uh, uh, some of the sports shoes, how you have those uh, cushioning things, um, uh, if you think about the underlying technology in uh, medical uh, scans, like uh, you've heard about MRI, CAT scans, and things like that. All of this comes from space technology. So you see how this tiny investment can be uh, can be used in other industries as well. So there's there's a lot of benefit, and apart from that, it's an industry that creates a lot of jobs for people, um, and it gets more people interested in doing um, what you call uh, STEM subjects. So that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And uh, for some people also uh, like me, that you would get interested in uh, doing art subjects, uh, so on. So the benefits are many. Um, you just need to question how and where space is applied in your daily life. This is just an example of uh, different uh, uh, space activities that you may be familiar with. Uh, if we start with the top left, uh, this is what you would call uh, satellite imaging. So this is often used to help monitor different kinds of things uh, that are happening uh, on planet Earth. So uh, I'll give you a few examples later, but this is uh, one of the fields. Here you see the International Space Station. Um, of course, it's not as fancy as it looks in the movies. It's, it's this picture in the center, so you can see it's it's very messy. It's, it has a lot of things, and astronauts uh, work there, um, and they don't just look out of space and do nothing. Their job is to carry out a lot of very important research um, uh, that is later brought back to Earth. So one of uh, my favorite things uh, from this year is that they are studying uh, the growth of uh, cancer cells uh, in space. 
Um, so the, the results that they would get out of these research will be then fed into the medical uh, field here to see how we can uh, uh, develop other mechanisms um, that, can, that can maybe one day uh, remove the idea of cancer itself. And here you see the uh, ISRO launch pad. Uh, you see um, a satellite uh, being ready, uh, being made ready for launch. You see these ground stations and uh, observatories. So there's plenty of activities that are happening. And then, um, where are these activities happening? On Earth, you see that um, they can be um, grouped into several things. You have several organizations that work only on manufacturing. Uh, ISRO alone has about 500 suppliers in India who are manufacturing things from uh, tapes to screws and bolts to large structures uh, and so on. So that's a big industry. You have the launch industry. So you would have heard news about how uh, ISRO is just, uh, or, or the Indian uh, uh, launches are not just for uh, Indian satellites, but also for foreign satellites. So there's a big business around that. Uh, you have to insure the satellites uh, you have to figure out what uh, what is the purpose of your satellite. So is it going to take uh, pictures? Is it going to look into space and, and so on? And then you have ground stations. So once you put things up on uh, um, uh, orbit, uh, that's not the end of it. You have to receive the data. So there's a lot of in infrastructure that is built around that. And once you get this data, you need to process it to make sense out of it. So you might get uh, uh, pictures, but you need to understand what those pictures mean. How can you use it in everyday life? So that's dealt with in processing. Um, and then you have uh, science, of course, which, um, uh, which gives us a lot of inputs that are not immediately visible, but uh, uh, things play out in, in the long run. Um, and you have something called suborbital flights. So for now, if I need to, uh, come to Chennai, um, it takes about 12 to 13 hours. Um, someday, uh, soon, we will have uh, what we call suborbital flights. So which means I can fly from point A to point B, so that being Netherlands to Chennai, in maybe an hour. So instead of the flight going over uh, different countries, it would just jump. It would touch a bit of the space and come to, um, come to another location. So there's a lot that is happening uh, in Earth. And then what is happening uh, in orbit? You would, uh, you would have learned about um, uh, how satellites are placed in different orbits. It's good to know also there are different kinds of orbits for different purposes. So you have something called a low Earth orbit, which is um, usually less than 1,000 kilometers. And this is where the International Space Station is. This is where you have uh, the Hubble telescope, which takes these amazing pictures of space. So we learn more about uh, other galaxies, how stars are born, how do they die, and so on. And this is also where you have satellites that, um, uh, that we use for Earth observation. So if we want to monitor uh, different things, how we use land, uh, are we cutting down forests, and so on. Are we? Uh, is this a good time uh, uh, for uh, farmers uh, to to introduce a new crop? So all these things are done with satellites in this orbit, and then you have uh, the medium Earth orbit, which is uh, which can be anywhere between three thousand to twenty thousand kilometers, and this is where your navigation satellites are. There. So if you use Google Maps, um, then you know where your signals are coming from. So it's coming from one of those satellites, or at least three of those satellites in the medium Earth orbit. And then you have something called the geostationary orbit, so which is um, which is a very valuable uh, orbit. Uh, it is considered um, a, a resource for satellites because it's a ring around thirty-five thousand kilometers. And the speciality is that if a satellite is fixed in that orbit, it can, based on the Earth's rotation, the satellite will also just rotate as it is, or it will just move like this. And this is where most of the uh, telecommunications and uh, weather satellites are placed. Just to give you an uh, example, in the top, uh, this is one of um, uh, the Indian companies that is using uh, satellite data. They are combining it with data that is just available in, in governments or in other uh, repositories and things. 
and they try to make some uh, sorts of insights into it. So they use amazing technology to see, okay, when can, um, uh, will the farmer have a good crop this season? Um, uh, or do they, do you think uh, it's going to be wasted? So if it's going to be wasted, what sort of um, uh, policies uh, should the government make? Uh, this is just an example. So they, they, they provide uh, data and insights to a wide range of subjects uh, in India itself. So that's, that's just to show how useful it is. And the second picture that you see, and this is an image uh, uh, which used satellite data again. And the red dots uh, are what represent uh, something called a brick belt. Uh, in North India. And uh, human rights organizations use the satellite data to, to assess when uh, uh, the brick kiln, so when single uh, uh, when they are running, are they using child labor and so on. So when they see that the operation level is high, then they can uh, tell the uh, people on ground, the field workers to say, okay, now the operation is high. So which means they perhaps could be using children uh, in their labor. So it's easier to uh, track it. It's easier to validate it. So nobody can lie about it. Um, and I would say, in a way, there's also less corruption because this data doesn't lie. After 60 years of space activities, and just to uh, give you another example, human -made object. after the fact that all these satellites are, are up in the sky doesn't mean that only good things uh, happen. Um, there are also certain challenges, uh, not just for engineers um, uh, and so on, but also for lawyers. And this is illustrated uh, in the video. After 60 years of space activities, there are around 29,000 human-made objects larger than 10 centimeters orbiting around Earth some operational, most dead. The vast majority of these objects drift freely in orbit at risk of collision. A one centimeter object could strike a working satellite with the force of an exploding hand grenade. Any collision would create more debris, which can lead in turn to a cascade of further collisions. As the total space launches per year go on increasing, the situation will only grow worse. Find a safe way to close in, then synchronize orbital paths. The second challenge is to actually capture it in a secure way. Two alternative mechanisms are currently under study. One would use a robotic arm, the other would employ a net. The final challenge will be to convey this massive item of debris down in a safe and controlled manner. So what you uh, saw here was just an example of uh, the big problem uh, that we are facing. Uh, some of you might have seen the movie Gravity. Um, it's very real. So a small object, which is, which is about uh, this size, can create a big uh, damage in space. And the thing about that is it puts all other satellites and, uh, in risk. And if the satellites are put in risk, all the benefits that we get. So you would lose uh, telecommunications, you would lose your navigation things, uh, ATM machines may, uh, may not work. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, effect for it. And as space lawyers, um, what we try to do is develop uh, guidelines on what measures should people take when you're putting satellites up in space. Uh, how should you be uh, responsible um, uh, for the satellites that you put up? And if there is a damage, then who takes care? Uh, who takes care of uh, the things that are damaged? Who would be liable for it, and and so on. So there are multiple discussions that are going on to see how we can also make the space environment uh, better. So we saw uh, activities that happen on Earth. Uh, then we saw things that are on orbit, and there are things that happen beyond it as well. So every time you hear about a mission to Moon, Mars, Jupiter, or elsewhere, or even to asteroids, there are different reasons for it. Um, one is uh, just science, to understand, uh, to, to learn more about it. We are, in general, uh, curious beings. So it is uh, for us to gain insight uh, about different things. 
Um, the second one is for resources. So at some point, we are trying to find uh, water. We are trying to find uh, minerals and things. The use of this is that you could, uh, let's say, several years down the line, several decades down the line, um, push or outsource uh, mining and things uh, to one of these planets or to an asteroid. So you sort of um, you sort of remedy the scarcity that we have on Earth. Uh, you could uh, offload pollution there. I don't know if that's a good thing, but but at least you can uh, do that. But even otherwise, it helps us to build uh, future missions. So um, you cannot think that in the future that we will constantly be sending water or uh, building things from Earth. Um, if you imagine, you could have a setup on uh, Moon or Mars from where you can, just like you have airports, you could have launches from there to uh, other planets, to other asteroids and so on. Um, is this science fiction or is this reality? Um, I would say it is It is reality. It's not a question of if it will happen. It's, it's more a question of when it will happen. Um, so you see that a lot of efforts are going on. You would have heard about Elon Musk uh, and Jeff Bezos. Uh, they are currently already building and testing things which will contribute to uh, us uh, living on, or us, I mean also future generations, living on uh, other planets uh, or moons uh, or asteroids and so on. So a lot of infrastructure is also being uh, designed. How do you, how can you do construction uh, on moons, uh, on, uh, uh, on the moon? Um, the European Space Agency, for example, is thinking about using the uh, soil from the moon itself to, to build materials there. Um, uh, can you build a factory? Uh, if you build a factory and nobody owns the moon, how can you make use of the resources? So that's something that space lawyers deal with as well. Um, I'm going to show you a quick video about um, uh, one such, uh, uh, let's say, organization that is trying to figure out how to build habitats uh, in space. And they take into account a lot of uh, interesting things. There's a legal element uh, to it as well that I will uh, talk to you in a few seconds. It's a big challenge. Getting there is hard. Surviving there is even harder. How do we build habitats to support human life on a planet so far away? We are Sega Space Architects and we are here in the desert of Israel. And the reason is, one of the ways we prepare for Mars is to test things in an analog environment. That means that we simulate all the mission aspects of going to Mars. Together with DMARS, we are testing a prototype space architecture on a simulated Mars mission. Sega has built an astrobiology laboratory. The essential part of the architecture is that it has to be really light so we don't waste a lot of fuel bringing it to Mars. This is why we made a thin structure that unfolds and deploys to become a much bar of atmospheric pressure. On Mars, you need a life support system. But instead of hiding it away as a hidden machine, we thought we could integrate it in the architecture. So we took algae. Algae is a sort of biological life support system in that through photosynthesis, it takes carbon dioxide and turns it into oxygen. Another benefit. So you see here that, uh, again, space is not just for uh, engineering uh, or, or different kinds of engineering. It's also architects uh, who are working on this. And when they test these things out, um, they look into different aspects. So one, they're looking at energy. They're looking at how they can survive in, uh, uh, with food. Uh, is there some way to combine all of this? Um, and, and there are many elements uh, that need to be uh, addressed. From a lawyer's perspective, you also need to, uh, I, I told you, we have a responsibility to keep uh, the, safe in, uh, the uh, safe environment in space. So we need to take steps to make sure that we don't carry pollutants from here to space. And at the same time, we don't carry back any dangerous substances from space back to the Earth as well. So there are committees uh, uh, around how we should uh, address these things. Um, there are policies laid down on this. Can we use nuclear uh, powers there? What if the nuclear power uh, is abused uh, to become a nuclear weapon? Uh, these are the sorts of uh, questions that we that we deal with. 
And uh, you might also recognize that with all these things that are happening, um, you see an interaction of different disciplines, different subjects coming in. Um, and that's the most exciting thing about working in space. So you're not confined to only the subject that you know. You have to interact with all the other fields as well. So that, for me, is uh, very interesting. And uh, my job, as I said, um, uh, I work as a commercial contracts uh, manager. Um, and I negotiate deals with uh, other uh, agencies or other uh, space uh, companies. Um, and it can be on a wide range of things. The picture that you see on the right, for example, this represents the number of parties that will be involved for, let's say, a tiny thing, maybe, maybe this ring over here. So to build this ring, so many people will be involved. And um, my responsibility, if I'm over here, is to make sure that all of this is coordinated. So it can be agreeing on intellectual property. It can be agreeing on uh, if something goes wrong, uh, who pays for it, uh, how should we resolve any, uh, uh, any fights, and uh, so on. So that is, that is in short, uh, my job. Um, and I, can, I, I spoke about space to um, a bunch of school students a few weeks ago. And uh, they mentioned uh, what you see here. Uh, so they said, OK, we have all these uh, ambitions. We want to be an engineer. We want to be a doctor. We want to do this, and we want to do that. And I had a question. So why not things that people don't usually choose immediately? Um, that's the first part. And the second part is, no matter what you choose here, you can do all of this in a space context. Um, there are, uh, there are uh, space medical experts who have to train astronauts, who have to replicate uh, the research that they do in space. They have to understand uh, uh, the uh, impact uh, that gravity has on, on bones, uh, the effect that radiation uh, has on our, uh, on our organs, and so on. And this uh, creates a big field which is studied by all other doctors to, to improve our, uh, our health uh, every day. Uh, so no matter what you choose, uh, even if you choose to be a chef, for example, you need to think about, uh, or even uh, farming, you need to think about how would humans in future sustain in space? Um, can they eat the same things? Or how will the idea of food itself change? So there are several options um, uh, that you can that you can uh, work with, and no matter what you choose, I want you to remember that if ever you want to be in space, there's always there's always space for you in space. Um, and the questions uh, that we often have: what subjects do we choose? What uh, should I be? Should I be an engineer? Should I be uh, a doctor? Should I, should I study abroad? Should I just stay here in uh, India? No matter what that question is, and no matter how old you are, it's not just for uh, students uh, in, in certain classes. Uh, even as, as a grown up, um, these are questions that I often uh, face. So am I doing the right thing? Am I doing, uh, do I make the right choices? And what really helps me is, to, um, is answering some of these questions. Um, I always start with, OK, what do I, what do I like? Uh, but it's also very important to know what I dislike. Um, and then you can also make a distinction between what are you good at um, and what you're not. So there might be something that you really like, uh, but it's perhaps something that you're not good at. Um, and what would really help then is to is trying to figure out, OK, what is stopping me from uh, becoming better uh, at this thing? Uh, or do I have to uh, make a change there? Um, and most of these decisions are driven by what uh, values we have. So maybe for some of us, family is very important. For some of us, friends are very important. For some of us, being in the same uh, city uh, will be very important. Uh, for some of us, we will say, oh, I can only study, I can only be friends with, or I can only work with people uh, who have the same kind of thinking. They should like the same things, and so on. So you have to figure out what values really drive you and what is important for you. Um, and then what sort of commitments you have. 
so do you have to do you have to take care of a parent do you uh, do you have a lot of um, uh, things around you uh, uh, that you have a commitment towards um, so that can also help you in making uh, the choices and it's very important uh, again uh, for you to know what uh, or who inspires you uh, it just doesn't have to be one thing from one person it can be one quality from one person and you can pick out different qualities from different people and it is also very important to have uh, someone who supports you so this can be your parent um, a teacher or a friend um this is someone you trust someone you can uh, uh, tell uh, uh, things with someone that you can discuss uh, any uh, issues that you have with and so on so if you ever feel struck uh, stuck try to go through this uh, worksheet um, and i hope it helps you um and there are for me there are a few other things uh, that are uh, very important i'm sure a lot of you recognize this um just to keep with time i will pick on uh, a few things that uh, i think are uh, are very important one is that um it's hard to say this is where i want to go and the path will be very clear um i think some uh, people are lucky if it's as straightforward as that um you should always know that whatever you learn whatever you do whether in a job or whether at home uh they all add to the person that you are and all of these small things can help you take the steps towards towards the goal that you have and sometimes your path may change and and that's that's really okay um so you need to you need to keep that in mind and um the next thing is that after you come out from from yourself look at people around you try to be kind uh, always to those around you and um when being kind it also means that you need to be kind to yourself so don't be too self critical if you think you're not good at something if you if somebody else hurts you talk to this trusted person ask for help um it can be very difficult but again no matter what your age is ask for help if you need it so others can't judge uh, that you need something so it can be as simple as Uh, that that you just want them to listen to you or that you have a small problem that they can help you with uh, but make sure you ask it um this can also help build a good relationship with the people around you um and in terms of uh, mindset i think uh, the first thing or the only thing that you need to know is that it is really okay to fail um not everybody uh, has to be uh, successful at the same time so success can come in different ways to different people in different times uh, and it's really okay to fail uh, try to accept that again try to ask for help when needed and with the people that support you uh, they would also understand if you fail um, so don't uh, all, never never let that uh, get you away from whatever your dreams and ambitions are so with that i would like to uh, conclude my uh, talk here are a few resources that you can uh, look up to uh, know a lot more about space um, i'm sure your teachers can uh, share this as well um, i'll have these slides uh, sent to you so in case you need to use it you can uh, refer them and with that i would like to end with this video <laughs> So this is especially for the girls uh this is just a reminder to tell you that um if you have a dream don't give that up uh try to get support from uh people around you and even if not try to go ahead and achieve it so there's nothing that can stop you it's a special reminder for the girls out there and with that thank you for uh listening to me patiently if you're still with me till the end and we can go to questions if there are any 
So, ma'am, that was so interesting, and uh, and the session was too good. And we have gathered more and more information, and we have received few questions from our students. Okay. So, uh, let me enter the questions. So, uh, what is your opinion on implementing law as a compulsory subject in schools, so that every citizen of our country knows the rules? They must follow rights they have, right? Yeah. So, what is your opinion about it? I think that there are two parts to it. So I think definitely everybody should know the law. Uh, even under law, we learn something uh, saying that if you don't know the law, it's not an excuse for not doing something. So um, I think everybody should know it. I don't know if it should be made compulsory because I remember we had civics um, as a compulsory subject. We still have civics as a compulsory subject. That is the basic law that we need to know as citizens. Um, but I don't know how many of us take that to heart. Um, so kids, even if you don't have law as a compulsory subject, learn about it, learn about the basic uh, rights that we have as citizens, learn about uh, the rights that people who are, um, learn about the rights that people around us have, um, and I think it's just like brushing your teeth. It doesn't have to be a subject in school, but you need to do it. Exactly. That was so nice, ma'am. Uh, so uh, what were the challenges you faced after choosing this career? Uh, can you share some? Yeah. Um, so for me, I was the first lawyer in my family. Uh, it's been uh, almost uh, 10, 10, 12 years since I graduated. And uh, even now, nobody in my family has studied law. They said, law uh, Then they said, um, uh, uh, Then they should do family law. They shouldn't do criminal law. Uh, court uh, court police station so there were a lot of challenges like this. And I was very scared because um, there's nobody that I can look up to immediately and say, OK, I need your help. Uh, but I had very good teachers and my friends, actually people from my own class and seniors, they helped me understand the subject. I remember the first internship that I went to. Um, this was the first week uh, for me in the Madras High Court. I didn't understand anything. They spoke in a language. They were speaking English, but I didn't understand anything that was going on. Um, and this was during my first year. Um, and if I look back now, it's it's funny and I can recognize that if, if it's something that's new that you are doing, you would always face this challenge, but uh, it's not uh, it's not something that should scare you off. That's so good. And uh, uh, what are the books related to science fiction that you would recommend to school students? OK, um, my favorite is the uh, Hitchhiker's uh, Guide to Galaxy. Um, this is a wonderful book. It's extremely funny as well. And it's one of the best science fiction books out there. Uh, so that's a strong recommendation for the children. And um, for, let's say, the older children, let's say, uh, beyond high school and so on, I would uh, suggest the Expanse books now. Um, if you are not in the habit of reading, uh, then you could also watch it as a series. I think it's on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's one of the best uh, science fiction novels about space that has uh, come out in recent times. So I will stop with two recommendations for now. Okay, okay, ma'am, that was too good. And uh, yeah, could you sh uh, please share about the book, The Innovation Matrix, a few lines about your book? Okay, um, so this was a complete accident. I studied intellectual property laws just because I, I like it, because I like art, design, I like movies. Um, so a lot of uh, the interest for me for intellectual property came from there. And when I started working here uh, in the company in, uh, in the Netherlands, I was talking to my, my manager one day. Uh, we were just generally talking about intellectual property. And she had written a book. No, she had written a master thesis uh, 10 years ago on, on a topic. And uh, she she had just kept it hidden. Uh, so she submitted it for uh, evaluation. She got her degree and then she forgot about it. And I read it 
and i thought okay this is this is so relevant even today um and then i said oh you you should make it a book and then she said okay if you're willing to write it then then let's go ahead and uh, make it a book and that's how we uh, made it but also one of the uh, things that we wanted to achieve was that a lot of people think even within lawyers they think it is a very boring subject it is very dull but it is something that everybody uses every day so we thought we need to make it fun we need to make it simple so if you look at the book it's almost like a comic book so yeah <laughs> that's the story that, that was so good man and uh, yeah which country outside of india do you think is the best place to do law undergraduate um this is my personal opinion yeah, i yeah, think your personal opinion i yeah. think if um i have very strong roots to india so i think if we study undergraduation anywhere else other than india it makes no sense because law is about uh, logic it is about social behavior and uh, the logic and social behavior that we are used to is the indian context um i would say start with undergraduation in india so you understand the legal concepts based on the social context that you know and then you can do your post graduation uh, anywhere else in the world there are different universities in uh, different countries that are uh, that are special so for example space law is um, is something that is very special in leiden in in netherlands where i studied and in another uh, university in canada and then there is something called biotechnology and genetic laws uh, uh, which is in the us which is very interesting as well so i would say have build your basis no matter what you choose it's not just for law no matter what you choose build your basis in india and then uh, spread out if you have to so our students will be watching and they'll follow your works man and yeah uh, can you share your experience in your first attempt like proceedings Oh. yes my my first uh, case this was um, this was in 2005 no 2004 2005 this was on uh, entrance exams so uh, this was the year it was uh, the case is called n priyadarshini versus uh, state of tamil nadu um, this was the year when um, uh, one of the students who secured very high marks in her board exams and then in something called an improvement exam i don't think it's there now um and uh, she scored high marks uh, but the marks came from the improvement exam and she couldn't get a medical seat she wasn't considered for a medical seat so she filed a case uh, questioning the government's uh, decision to abolish or to not consider the improvement exam marks um and then she of course the the ruling was in her favor they were they it was asked to um, the government was asked to consider her for uh, this subject um and you see that the same discussions keep happening only in different contexts and so now you have the discussions on uh, neat exams so yeah that was my first case okay that was good to know me and the last question uh, what would you like to advise for the future generation i mean in a single sentence or in a single statement i think that was my yeah. last slide i will say never forget the the child in you even as you grow older you think okay you you know everything you you become this big shot whatever it is don't forget the child in you because a child can forgive easily a child doesn't let uh, failures get in the way of what it wants and a child will always maintain good relationships with people and i think these are very important in in life so sure, ma'am that was so good and uh, nice talking with you uh, now let me call uh, my colleague mr shri ram to give the out of thanks ma'am thank you thank you hi uh, let me start with the space court uh, space is common ground and everyone is allowed to explore it It's a great pleasure to deliver the thank you note. We have given a lot more information regarding the space economy, space law, and space habits. Habits. Uh, this would definitely help students uh, think about and choose different career options. On behalf of Pushpala the schools and Pushpala the Vidya Mandir, thank you so much, ma'am, for spending your valuable time with us. 
uh, the ideas and the information shared by you were not only interesting but also new to us. I'm sure our students will explore uh, further and benefit. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So thank you all. Uh, you are watching Pushpalada Learned Live channel. Uh, and this is uh, um, Sri Ram and uh, signing off this with uh, Mr. Jude. Take care. Bye-bye.